we, we, we got to do the, uh, do the dance off competition. Maya Hustle, where are you, dude? Oh, we'll have to harass them later. All right. Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Monte, and uh, I do Koken strippers. Well, I do Koken strippers for educational purposes only. I mean, I do the YouTube channel, Diet Coke and Wire Strippers. It's an electronics channel. It's Coke and Strippers for short. So anyway, you should check it out. It's, it's awesome. Y'all having fun yet? Hello? Anybody home? Yeah, okay. Oh, and afterwards, I have a few of these little chips to give away. So um, if you want one, uh, take a picture Tag me on social media, show me afterwards, and I'll give them away till I run out. I'll put this back up later. Okay, so let's get started. So this all comes from the Bloomberg article. Who remembers the Bloomberg article? Yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe that there are chips put on the motherboard. We're calling this chipping to attack, uh, to attack computer systems but nobody actually found any evidence that, that these were in place yet. Everybody denied it. Um, uh, it, would be, it would be a serious event though if it happened, right? Because there's, um, it's impossible to detect with, with our normal kind of tools, right? You're, you can check the firmware, you can check the config, you can, you can do all these things and you won't see the hardware that, that's hiding inside. So that's kind of, different, kind of exceptional about it. It could be in, in various pieces of equipment. It'll survive re-imaging. Normally, air protocol is if something gets compromised, what do we do? We take it and, and put a new flash image on it or, or, or we flash new firmware or, or we redo the config. Uh, but in this case, it doesn't help, right? That doesn't change the hardware that's built in and introduced in the supply chain. And that's scary, right? That's something that, that we don't control is, is air suppliers, the people who give us stuff. So if, if that were a real attack, it would, be, uh, it would be rather scary. But no definitive proof yet, right? Maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't. So I decided it doesn't matter. Let's make it true, right? Nothing better than, than taking a good idea and, and making it happen. And maybe we can make it look better than this. <laughs> I don't know. So I had to pick a target. And uh, I do industrial control system work. So that was sort of my first thought. And along those lines, I was thinking serial ports, maybe easy and common in industrial control system equipment, right? Lots of serial ports everywhere. And then once I, once I got there, I thought, well, why not a Cisco firewall? Because not only does that hit the ICS, the industrial control system side, but that sort of hits everybody, so probably a broader interest. So I picked a, um, a Cisco firewall because they're popular. You know, it's not that, not that they're particularly um, vulnerable to this attack, they just, they just drew the short straw, so. Um, yeah, so the decision was made to go the serial port. It's fairly easy, fairly simple protocol in lots of industrial control system equipment anyway. Now, as a quick review, um, serial ports are fairly simple devices, and uh, I want this to be simple, easy, all right? I'm trying to do, you've heard the 80-20 rule? Who's heard like 80-20? All right, you get 80% of the benefit for 20% of the effort. I'm more like the, the 51 rule. I'm trying to get 50% of the benefit for 1% of the, of the nation state cost. So, um, Serial ports, fairly easy. Uh, we'll have a transmit line, a receive line, and ground for the serial port. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, in this attack, I'm also using a piece of cheap... Chinese hardware, these uh, eight channel serial analyzers. It just helps when I can read multiple serial streams simultaneously, so I'll use this. It seems to me there's some kind of irony though in using cheap Chinese knockoff equipment to build a Chinese attack into <laughs> hardware perhaps. So, um, 
It uses uh, this open source software called PulseView. It's free. I'm not part of the you know, the, not part of that group, but I think it's good software. And if you want to start, if you want to get into kind of hardware hacking, uh, buying one of those $7 eight channel analyzers uh, and using the software is probably a good place to start. But it allows me to uh, look at these serial signals uh, uh, on multiple channels. And here we can see the actual uh, IO. We see the levels. Uh, high, low, um, these are the, the actual bits provided. And then finally, if we were going to interpret them as ASCII, these are the ASCII characters, config something with start and stop bits. So as I'm trying to build something that will send and receive serial, this is helpful for diagnostics. So uh, RS-232, or now TIA-232, uh, is, has these sort of signal levels. It's typically like plus and minus 15 volts, which is what these um, Cisco devices do. It's kind of plus and minus 15. And that's an issue because I'm thinking about chipping this, building a chip to put in to attack the system, a microcontroller. And these devices are five volts typically, or at least, you know, the ones I like to deal with. So plus and minus 15 volts on this communication channel may be enough to fry the microcontroller. Well, that's not good. Um, perhaps I could add a second chip, a line driver, but then it's two chips. And that's, you know, I mean, we're trying to keep this thing as, as, as quiet, as small, as under the radar as possible. So adding a second driver chip is, is really not what I'm looking for. But there's a trick. Turns out doing some other work, I've discovered from, from an app note that these devices all have uh, these protection diodes built in. So if the voltage goes too high, it clamps to the, to the VCC side. Or if it goes too low, it clamps to the, to the ground rail. And that can keep the device from being harmed. But these protection diodes are only good for like one milliamp, not very much current. That's okay, I just have to pick an appropriate resistor, which is about 15 kilo ohms. So with that, I should be able to connect to this 15 volt uh, RS-232 and read the signals. I don't know if I can write them yet, but at least I should be able to read them without frying the microcontroller. And that's a good start. Um, turns out I end up going with 5.1K, which is a little out of spec for, for the amount of current that those diodes are supposed to, uh, supposed to be able to handle, but it works, and I needed a little more current to drive uh, the, the receiver in this uh, firewall to be able to receive the commands as part, of this, as part of this attack. So I'm always trying to start with the simplest thing possible, right? Um, I'm a firm believer that success lies on the far side of failure. Right? So, so my job is always to fail fast. See how fast I can, I can get, to, uh, get to success. So that involves testing things as quickly and cheaply as possible. So I begin with, with these Arduino boards. I had a mega Arduino mega laying around. I'm thinking that's probably the kind of processor I'll use in the end. Uh, but so it's a quick and easy test. So I wire it up to a serial cable uh, and it works. I'm able to communicate back and forth. So, so that's a good start. But now I want something smaller than this, something we can potentially hide, right? This is about chipping, nation state attacks. It's, it's, it's supposed to be something smaller. Um, so a couple of options I discovered, this AT Tiny 10, this thing is minuscule. Right, pretty small. Um, and then this AT Tiny 85. I end up choosing the AT Tiny 85. I could, I could run this attack with the AT Tiny 10, but the 85 has some advantages. Uh, it has EEPROM so that I can store things in the microcontroller. The the this 10 does not have storage, so I can't like count the number of reboots or, or try to track how long the system has been up or, or store anything in it. So EEPROM is good. 
And it was a lot easier for the development. But we'll see for a couple of reasons, but um, because I could get it on an existing board that was easy to program, and I could use the Arduino IDE, which is fairly simple, straightforward. So I don't need any kind of special hardware programmer or, or, or any complicated development tools. So ATtiny85. And here's the board that it's on. Uh, they're not very expensive. You can get five of them for $10 US on eBay or Amazon either. Uh, and a matter of fact, so these are the ones, I, I have a few of these to, to hand out afterwards. They're, they're not programmed, that's up, for you. that's up to you, but uh, I do have a few of them here with me. But they're relatively cheap, relatively uh, easy to deal with. So uh, decided to uh, use them instead and... If you could tell on the edge of this board, there's this USB connector. So I can plug it straight into a USB cable for programming. And then when I get done, uh, I will unplug it and desolder the ATtiny85. That's this little chip on this side. This is just the, the power regulator and some other stuff. So the only part that, we, that I really want in the end is this little chip over here. This board just makes it easier to deal with in the setup. So I'm good there. Uh, now to uh, test, right, I'm, I'm also paranoid, so uh, I want to test to make sure the ATtiny85 on this board will work, and I connect it up without trying to solder it to anything uh, to make sure it's going to work, and sure enough, it, it, it looks like it's going to work just fine. Um, Here's a little snippet of what the code looks like. The code really isn't very complex. The only thing the code does is it sends various legitimate Cisco commands to the serial port. So it prints out those commands on the serial port. The most complicated part of that was um, programming this DigiSpark board because normally you just hit um, the program button in this IDE, and when you do that, uh, like over here, it will program. The, it will take the program that code that you you have and write it onto the board. But these digit sparks are a little more complicated. When you're ready to program those, you have to unplug it and plug it back up. So it'll only program for a few seconds after plugging this back up. So if you get one of these and you're trying to program it, you'll need to unplug it and plug it back up for it to be programmed. So after it's programmed, I've tested it. It looks like it's going to work. Now I need to install it on the motherboard on this Cisco firewall. So uh, I have a a hot air rework station, it's about 150 bucks, it blows hot air out of here. Just makes it easier to pull the chip off of this board. All right, I'm taking this chip off and it, since I can heat all the pins simultaneously, it's a little easier to pull it off. You could do it with, with, with other tools, perhaps just a soldering iron or some solder wick or solder sucker. There, there are various different tools to do this desoldering, but the, uh, the hot air re rework makes it a little easier. Once again, I list these devices. Look, I don't get any feedback. I don't get any payback from, from these companies. But people always ask me, what did you use? How expensive was it? So that's what these links are about. These are just the tools that I used. Um, this cheap Chinese microscope so that I can kind of see the pins and see what's going on. That helped. Uh, tweezers. Oh, I did leave out one thing. I, I used a cheap soldering iron. Uh, I have a nicer one, but the the tip on it was too large and I didn't have any smaller tips. So I have a, a cheap soldering iron with a small tip and that's, that's really the t all the tools that are, that are necessary. So for the installation, this chip needs power, ground, and then for the serial port we need TX, transmit, and RX, receive. So uh, it would be a four wire installation. I could put this chip, you know, anywhere on the motherboard with 
super glue and run four wires and, and make this thing work. And then I realized that, well, I don't actually need four wires because I'm not receiving anything from the firewall back to my chip. I'm just sending commands. I only need transmit. So now I'm down to three wires. So now I can put this thing anywhere on the board that I want. And I just have to run three wires and connect them to, to power and ground and, and, and receive on the, uh, on the Cisco side. So wires like that sometimes show up on motherboards. We call them bodge wires when, when things need to be fixed. So this is one that, that might show up for real. But what I really don't want to happen is to look like this, right? This is some other, somebody modifying a circuit. That looks like a mess. It's easy to spot. Nobody wants that. So the next question becomes, is there a better way to install this? A, a, a more subtle way to install it? So I'm looking around on the board. Here's, here's one from, a, from another device. And I'm looking around on this board. Can I, where can I find power and ground and the transmit, maybe have them relatively close together so that I can connect this chip? And what I discovered, uh, there's this connector on here. This that looks like an Ethernet port. That's the serial connector, RJ45, and two USB connectors on there. So serial, USB, USB. On the bottom of that looks like this. So over here, all these are the serial pins. And then here are two rows of USB pins. So now relatively close together, I have power, I have ground, and I have the receive line that, that I need to connect to. So that's getting better. Take a little detour here. So this is a small resistor, very tiny. Anybody know what, what is the value of this resistor? Come on. What's the value? Zero, right? This is a zero ohm resistor. What's the, why do I want a zero ohm resistor? Well, yeah, sometimes you use it for, for a placeholder or, or a jumper of some kind. And in this case, I use it as a jumper. Its value to me is that this chip will fit right between those pins, more or less, on the bottom of this motherboard um, with a zero ohm resistor. I use the ground from the serial port because the power and ground on this chip are kind of diagonally opposite, right? I've got power down here from the USB supply. I've got ground over here from the serial port. And then I have the, the RX, the receive port on the, on the firewall there together. And the, uh, the resistor that I need for the receive port and combined with the zero ohm resistor makes it pretty much just fit in place, right? It's not beautiful, but it's not bad. I'm impressed. I'm like, I've got this thing, right? That's easy. Look, I found a place. It fits. It's, it's, it's perfect. So I fire it up. And part of the trick of this, we'll, we'll talk a little more about it later, but part of the trick is that you have to catch these firewalls during the first few seconds of the boot and send them some escape characters. But after I installed this chip here, it didn't work anymore. It turns out that they don't enable the power to the USB ports until after this firewall has entirely booted. It's like, now what am I going to do, right? It's the middle of the night. I'm getting ready to come to a conference. Uh, I, I did, and I look, I did all the testing. It, it, it works out, but no power. So, well, I guess worst case, again, I can run a bodge wire. I mean, I was so happy this was going to work, but I don't have power. I start looking around for, for where power might be nearby, uh, other places, looking around where it comes from. And I find this chip nearby. This is the power distribution switch. Its job, and what it actually does, is it takes a small signal from the computer on the firewall motherboard. And when it gets that signal, it turns on the heavy duty current to power those two USB ports. Oh, now, now, now we're getting somewhere. 
Uh, we see, I see where the signal comes in and where the power goes out. Um, and so what I realize is that if I bridge two of the pins on this power switch, it will stay on all the time. Right? And the easy way to do that is with a solder bridge. So sometimes a mistake on a motherboard is when two pins are accidentally connected together. In this case, I did that on purpose. Like, I actually, I think this is the coolest part, the coolest hack of the whole thing, right? Is that I get to use a solder bridge as part of the attack. And if you look at it, who, who here is like, does electronic work as a hobby or profession? Okay, maybe a third of the audience, maybe a little less, right? So a solder bridge is normally a bad thing, but you might, you know, it might pass as, as an accident. In any case, now I can get power when the machine first comes up. Uh, so I am happy. So now you've seen where this chip goes. You've seen it installed. Uh, can you find it, right? It's somewhere, this is, this is the, the front of the motherboard. This is the back. It looks like these, these are a little, a little fuzzy here. Those are kind of hard to see. I'll hold this up. Is this better? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's on there. Um, it's actually right there. You could see it. I mean, I, like we posted this picture once without the circle. And I'm like, you know, maybe somebody will see it. Possibly. I kind of doubt it. Uh, actually, two people saw it fairly right away. One of them was a buddy of mine who does a bunch of reverse engineering. I'm like, come on. Like, yeah, the, the ground fill shouldn't have any chips there. And it's obvious that that's, an, and besides, it's a crappy soldering job. I'm like, yeah, okay, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> so it's not impossible. Right? You, can, you can find it if you look. But in order to actually find this thing, uh, I counted, you have to take 14 screws. This is, you know, this is the... This is it in the case. You take 14 screws out, including a couple on the motherboard, and you pull the motherboard out and turn it upside down. And then if you look over here in the corner, um, there it is. So let me ask you this. You get a brand new piece of security equipment for your site. What's the first thing you do? Take all the, take all the screws out of it and pull the motherboard out and turn it upside down? Anybody? Oh, okay, we got at least one. Paranoid, huh? I'm with you. There are better hiding places, actually. So on this, in, this, in this connector, in this can, you can desolder four pins on the bottom and pull this metal shield off. And in the back of this, so this is the front side, this is the back side. In the back, there's more space than in the front. You could hide the, the chip in there, solder this can back on. Now, if you're going to look for it, you have to take it apart and you have to desolder all these different cans and metal pieces and pull them off of your brand new equipment and put it back together before. So, not particularly likely. This is my secret weapon right here, right? I found these on eBay. They're awesome. They're a warranty void if removed stickers. They have a hologram. They're serialized, they have a barcode, they look super official, right? You shove one of these on the box, nobody's gonna open it. No. It's, it's like supply chain judo, right? You're using, you're using the defense against supply chain attacks to implement a supply chain attack. What's better than that? Love those. All right, so it is time for a demo. Um, we're gonna start with a serial cable. Let me change up the screens here for just a second. All right. Well, I was doing that anyway. So let's imagine that uh, a security administrator somewhere just bought them a new firewall and they've set it up. And I'm just now booting it. Turn the switch on. You'll see it boot through, through a regular serial connection. So the last thing they do before they take it off their desk, right, and put it into the rack is, is, is they're going to do one more boot, one more look at that. And, that. and that's what this is. Notice it's waiting a few seconds for this escape. But 
nobody presses any keys, right? We're just going to let it boot and test it. So in this window, uh, let's see. All right, I'm just pinging this device to see when it, come, when it finishes rebooting and comes online, uh, waiting for it to boot. Uh, like you would. So you imagine system administrator gets this, he sets it on this desk, uh, he or she connects up a serial port, they configure it, they put in the passwords and the routes and so forth, uh, it, because when they get done, they're going to take this, and if it's a larger device in particular, then when they get done, they're going to put it in a rack somewhere in, in a server room. So, error last check here, waiting for it to come up. There we go. Now we have pings. So this device is up on the network. I've, I've got an Ethernet cable here that I can check it with too. Um, and after that, I'm going to run an Nmap scan. Who here knows? Anybody use Nmap? Okay, yeah, at least half the audience. That's to see what services and ports are available on this device. And if we take a look here, basically, I just checked a few for the demo. None of these are open. In particular, SSH isn't open. Right? That's the way we would like this device to be. We, we would like it to run. That's the way it's supposed to work. All right. Um, I'm going to plug up another cable here for a second. It's not part of the attack. I'll explain it in a minute, but it takes a minute to boot. So let me get this, uh, let me get this other cable started, and then I'll tell you what it's about. So unplug a regular serial cable. Unplug my sensor, sort of, sp or plug in my special sensor here. Uh, it connects to USB uh, here. Let's get that software running. Wait a minute. All right, and that is the software that, that runs that eight-channel analyzer. By the way, if you notice here, we'll see it waiting for just a second for that, for that escape. And somebody typed an escape. All right, so now I'll tell you what I did. You can sort of watch this attack run uh, as, as I'm talking. But uh, what just so happens that not only am I good looking, <laughs> but I'm also lucky. Those that resistor that I put in uh, when I soldered this uh, attack chip in place uh, only allows a very small current to go through to protect the device. And that means whenever the administrator takes his regular Cisco cable and plugs it in, this 15 volts and higher current overwhelms the signal of my implant. So if anybody plugs this cable up, they will not see an attack and the attack won't happen. This keeps the attack from happening. So this other cable, this is not part of an attack. This is just a, a high impedance serial connection. So we could see the attack and not block it. We can actually see what's happening. So again, this is just hardware that most people wouldn't have, but so that we can see what goes on during the attack. So now let's do, uh, start the same thing down here where we will start pinging. So what this, uh, what this attack has done is it's used the Cisco password recovery feature to boot without a password. It loaded the existing config that was on there. This, I'll let the system administrator do that. I don't know what that should be. It turns on SSH and it installs an account, username and password that only I know, right? So now I have SSH available with my own. Look, if you're going to hack a device, if, if, if we're going to attack this thing, we might as well use SSH and do it securely, right? So, um, so that is done when, when a cable isn't connected. That'll happen any time a cable isn't connected. I've just connected this special one so we could see it. And ping is up. So it's gone through all those steps. 
it's rebooted. If you watched, you could, you could see it do every command at a time. Oh, and here's the last command. By the way, the last step is ping. That's my, ad, my address for this demo. Uh, so it sends out four ping packets. What's that? That's my notification that this device has been compromised and now it's available. All right, so let's run InMap on this device. And what do we get? Uh, we get SSH is now open. Thank you very much. Uh, not only is it open, uh, I've started up SSH. Uh, I want to do enable in this router, right? I'm connected to over the internet. I've hacked their router. It's, it's, this is across this ethernet cable, the password. Uh, so the username is Sully. The password is monster. Anybody know that reference? Sully, the monster, monsters, Inc. Oh, never mind. Okay, so show enable. There we go. We have full access uh, to the device at this point remotely across the network. All right, so I'm going to go back. I've got just a minute or so and talk about All right, so these are the steps of the attack. Uh, again, uh, just vaguely, but you can follow that from this Cisco uh, uh, password recovery document primarily and a, and a little bit of, of Cisco router knowledge. Uh, when it came up, we entered the escape character that gave us local access. That's the password sort of reset um, uh, feature. Now, So then we're allowed to boot it. We're, we're, we have root admin level access because somebody's in front of this device, or at least that's what it thinks with a serial cable. So they need to be able to recover it. We add the SSH, we add the account, add some routing, uh, ping to let us know we're there. All right, so we said that the interesting implications here is that you cannot detect this hardware with any of your software scans at least before the attack happens. It's, it's not possible, right? It exists outside of your universe, outside of that space. It'll survive re-imaging. The attack is invisible because it doesn't happen whenever a regular Cisco cable is enabled. Like if I reboot it now, it'll, the attack will happen again. We just won't see it because, because I'm not there. So imagine this debug cycle. You get a new device, you bring it here, you plug it up, you set it up, you check it, you test it, it works fine. You unplug it, you put it in the rack, and when you power it back up, it gets the new config. Now, at some point, maybe you go back in and you scan all of your devices, right? Who, who scans their firewalls after they've already set them up and tested them once? Who tests them again when you move them in place? Very good. We have a few hands, much more paranoid people. Um, so sooner or later, you might scan it and, and find out something's wrong. And you look at the config, and the config's got something added to it. Uh, so maybe you modify that, you change it. Um, uh, maybe you pull this device, and you bring it back to your desk. You say, what happened to it? And you plug into it, and you set, all the, the, you, you set the config the way you want it, and it looks great. You test it, and it works great, right? And then you take it back to the rack, and you plug it back up, without a serial cable connected, and it gets reinfected. The, the config gets modified. So, all right. I'm, I'm just thinking that, I don't know. I think that, de, that kind of debug cycle would be funny to watch. <laughs> so this is my kind of 1%, you know, 1% of the effort model to show that, that it's possible. We could do some more advanced things. Right now, this attack only happens, only gets triggered when this device reboots, 
when somebody unplugs it and puts it in a rack or the power goes off and comes back up, that's when the attack will happen. One of the things I could do instead is uh, I could let it reboot and maybe run for a while and then do the attack. For that, I would need to find a reset line, probably find a reset line on the CPU and hit that. Might need a bodge wire. Uh, it gives me a little more flexibility might be a little more visible. Just, just some thoughts for, for potential enhancements. Um, I'm also sending these commands blind. I'm not looking for the responses. I could write something like an expect script. Expect is a kind of Unix utility to help you deal with serial terminals to make it maybe more robust or, or fancier. Um, I might be able to store password changes. So. If the passwords, if I was actually reading all of, the, all of the, the serial communications that came in the serial port when somebody else was plugged in, if they set up a password, I could possibly read that password, store it in the EEPROM, and exfiltrate it somehow. Now I can get back in this device without having to add a new account. I could use the administrator's account. Not a feature I have right now, but you know, something to consider for, for enhancements. Or if I'm going to put stuff in here, maybe I could build some kind of radio frequency communication or data exfiltration or password exfiltration. I do a little SDR communications work. Maybe you've seen my data diode hack attack. There's some video somewhere. So RF is, is interesting. So those are some of the ways that we could potentially uh, enhance this. So defenses. How do we defend? How do you defend against this thing? I used to call hardware attacks uh, Miyagi-style attacks. Who, who's seen the movie The Karate Kid? Okay, good. Because, right, he had right, the, whoa, the, the, <laughs> the crane attack. And what he said about the crane attack was, if do right, no can defense. All right, so I used to think that these attacks, right, there, there was really nothing you could do about them. But I, I don't really believe that anymore. I think there are some things that, that you can do reasonably. You could take a look at the hardware in your devices. If you're in a particularly sensitive site or industry, look, you probably don't do it by default, but you could pull it out and, and you could look over it. And this isn't, you're not gonna see this right away, but I could teach, you know, I could teach an intern to do this in, in an hour or two, or, or somebody who's used to, to, to soldering and doing electronics work. They could say, hey, that looks hand soldered, which is different than the, than the machine soldering of the rest of it. So you could, you, could, you could potentially see that. That's not an impossible task. You could do regular configuration baselining where you check the configuration of your devices against what it should be, right? If you do that monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, I don't know. But check this on a regular basis. My attack changes the config. So you could see that if you're monitoring the config on a regular basis. Uh, it's probably also a good idea to do firmware hashing and baselining. Can you pull the firmware off the device and make sure it hasn't changed? My attack doesn't modify the firmware, but if we're talking about defenses against some of these attacks, uh, I would consider doing that for the firmware as well probably want to do some RF baselining in your plant, in your site. Is there a new transmitter that you haven't seen before? Uh, again, sort of on the horizon of what we're doing. If you have a very mature security program, you probably want to start, your next step might be looking at RF. Uh, but that's, that's for a rather mature program. There is one other defense against this one in particular. There's a Cisco command called no service password recovery that prevents you from being able to go through this password recovery. I have never seen a Cisco device that has that turned on. You'd be the first, or maybe you do it already. Anybody actually, I mean, it's probably not a bunch of Cisco admins, but anybody actually use this command? No, with Cisco, yeah, no, okay, no hands. Um, but you could theoretically do that. And that would make this attack more difficult. I wouldn't say it's 100%. I would say it was partial because if I am capturing the user passwords on the way in and storing them, adding this line would not prevent me from attacking the, the box with the hardware device I'm using. But it's potentially uh, uh, it's something that you could do and you should probably do. Like I bought several of these on eBay. 
none of them had that protection. They all had the user configs and password hashes and whatever. So uh, I haven't seen anybody use it, but, but maybe you should. So what I learned is, look, it's not really that difficult. Fairly hard to install if you sort of imagine, how do I get this into the supply chain? Maybe I resell these on eBay, or maybe I can do some social engineering like, hey, I have a bunch of routers for sale for your company cheap, or I can pretend to be a, a router reseller. Uh, I might be able to do it not by attacking, let's say, Cisco, for instance, but the supplier for Cisco. If I built it inside of these cans, uh, maybe if I could convince Cisco to buy these for me, it would already be installed. Or if I had nation state level resources, I could interdict shipments and install the thing and send them back on the way. Um, but right now I think it's only for, for very kind of targeted attacks, not yet for, um, for, for everybody. Why, why not now? Why, why, why don't people go to this trouble now? And the reason is because between the time I started doing this attack and now, what well, Cisco has had, I don't know, two or three remote code execution vulnerabilities that they ship themselves in their firmware, right? So if they're shipping vulnerable stuff, look, again, no diss to Cisco. This happens to a lot of companies. But if that's already happening, I don't have to do supply chain attacks, right? So supply chain attacks are going to be for when you're, you're, you already have a certain level of maturity in your systems, um, then your attacks will come from your trusted partners, and that's a good thing. When your attacks come from your trusted partners, that means your security is pretty good. And it's a much more pain, it's much more difficult for me to go after your partner who might send a device to you. So it's probably not quite now, but I want you to look for it. It's next, right? After you get your security locked down, these attacks are probably next. And as my last comment, um, one of the things I suggested is to open up the motherboard and look for, for things that look peculiar, bizarre on there. And I found this factory original schmoo, that's a technical term, on, on the motherboard already. Uh, so in particular, there's this big glob of, of silicone. You can't really see it in here, but there's a big glob of silicone covering these. What's it doing there? I don't know, gluing things down, holding them together, insulating stuff. So I don't know, it looks a little bizarre and there's a couple of them. And right beside where I installed this, this was before I did the installation, there's this like corrosion or stuff. Um, so, um, you know, and after thinking about it a while, I'm wondering, well, could this already be a supply chain attack on this motherboard? If I'm looking at this and I see this stuff, could this already be one? And I'm like, no, of course not. Who would do something like that? All right, my name is Monte. Uh, here's my contact info. If you want to uh, uh, tweet something out and pick up one of these chips, let me get off stage because you know we'll have we'll have other t uh, speakers coming up. But at some point, you can come by, and I will hand out some of these chips until I run out. Uh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was really for dummies, this one. It was, <laughs> you managed to explain something really difficult for, so even I understood it. So, which means that you also answered most of the questions that came oh, in. Oh, well, perfect. Uh, before did, I... Do we I, sit down or yeah, do we Yeah, if we you wish. It's, I'll, it's, I'll follow you. Sorry? I'll follow oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, let's sit down. So, the way I don't I, get I, lost. I'm getting old, so I need to sit down for a while. <laughs> so, so uh, awesome. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, and as I said, most of the questions were already answered by yourself. Uh, so, so, but if we go back and, and uh, talk a little about this in, in, in the perspective of what it means to the world, that's one of the questions here. Um, uh, well, again, I think there's, in most security programs, there are other things to consider first. But once you start considering those, or if you're in a particularly sensitive industry or installation, it's time to start thinking about chipping attacks. They're easy enough that, you know, if, if I'm thinking about it and I'm doing one of these attacks, other p thinking about it, if I'm thinking about it, other people have been doing this for five years, 10 years or more, right? Matter of fact, uh, chipping sort of attacks go back maybe 
maybe into the 1940s. Uh, we, we could talk about some of those stories later, but get your other security in place first, but be aware of what's on the horizon for you. And what's on the horizon might be chipping attacks once your other security becomes more solid. Right. So, so what you're saying is that you believe that there's already hardware out there that has been manipulated. Maybe? Uh, I don't have, personally, I don't see, well, I see some evidence of old ones, right? There was the, the thing in the U.S. Embassy where a chip was put in a, a plaque. Uh, there was some uh, chip chipping of old teletypes. I think that was maybe in the 40s or 50s. So, yes, we, we've seen some of it back, you know, what's that, 60 years or more, 70 <laughs> almost, wow. Um, no, 60. Anyway, uh, so they, they have been out there. They, they do exist. The, the question is, is, is it practical for, for your attacker? Is it feasible? Is the cheapest thing for me to do to, chit up, to set up a, a, a chip fab and manufacture custom chips and harass a motherboard provider to get them in there? Right now, the easiest thing to do is probably look for vulnerabilities, yes. things that you haven't patched, exactly. bad firewall rules. Yeah. That was actually one of the questions. I mean, does it make sense to actually do the, perform this kind of attack when there's so many software vulnerabilities yeah, out there? Probably not yet, but it's starting to. Okay. All right. So, so one more question, uh, and this is also very interesting. Uh, who was the other person that spotted the chip? I'm sorry, what? When you said a two po person spotted the chip, when you, you, you show them your oh, soldering stuff, oh, sorry. you only mentioned one. Well, one of them was a friend of mine, one of them I didn't know. So, so oh. just a couple of people off, off the internet noticed it. So. Off the internet, yeah. You didn't yeah. meet them in the street and just look no, at Starbucks? No, no, and you look at, no. Okay, I, right. I, I posted this on my Twitter account just to see if anybody could spot it without the, without the, the, red, the red circle at, at, at that point, which you've probably seen right. thanks to Andy's article, by the way. Uh, by the way, Andy, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so, oh, one more thing I, I forgot to mention is um, I do have a friend who used to build IoT devices. Mm -hmm. And he told me after uh, uh, I, I sort of ran this, this past him, he said uh, when he sent his devices off to be manufactured, that they would often come back from Chinese suppliers with a, with a different part or two on them. <laughs> with some explanation like, well, the chip you specify doesn't fit in our automated pick and place machine, or these were cheaper, and, and now we, we've brought your motherboard back. So you would often get motherboards back that had changes on them with a good excuse, and they were a little cheaper, and as long as they passed his quality control, he was fine with that. So, so that might be the, the concept of, of having a change come through that gets okayed uh, isn't, such a, isn't such a wild idea after all. Okay, thank you for that sc <laughs> scary thought <laughs> as an end, ending a statement. Thank you very much, Monte. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Monte.